Hi everyone, I am extremely enthusiastic to be joining you this time for a virtual roadshow in which we're going to learn together about how to write a laboratory notebook. Laboratory notebook is like the journal of science and it is very much a, a journal, something that you become very close to, something that you develop an intimate relationship with um, because it is your means to reflect upon the science that you're doing to um, also write clear data and observations about every experiment that you're doing, but also how to plan for that experiment that you're going to do. So it's an extremely important um, piece of doing good science. And now people are starting to use electronic notebooks, but I think it's great to also use a hard bound notebook, particularly if you're going to be running around in the field or in the lab, it's easier to write in a bound notebook. I also think it's just great to learn how to write your first lab notebook as a hard bound lab notebook. So the first thing that you want to do is to establish a relationship. Yes, a relationship with your lab notebook. And that might mean that you go to the store and you buy the perfect bound hardback notebook. In my case, during the COVID um, social distancing, I decided instead that I was going to go on to my old bookcase and find an old bound book and this is a 1980 yes I know that tells you how old I am um, bound uh, daily reminder book this is a perfect laboratory notebook because you'll see that it's hardback it's bound it's very durable um, and it has it has the kind of lined pages that we want in a laboratory notebook so what I'm going to do to begin is to um, make this my own. And we all kind of like that notion of legal graffiti. We get to label this notebook. So the first thing that you're going to want to do in my case, because I'm repurposing this, I'm actually going to get rid of the daily reminder. And I've got a couple different pens here to help me with this. I've got a silver pen. I've got this really thick blue Sharpie. So this seems to work well for marking this off. It's no longer a 1980 daily reminder book. Um, but now it's going to be uh, my um, laboratory notebook to teach about laboratory notebooks. So <laughs> um, how about we call this the lab, the teaching lab notebooks, notebooks. So I'm just gonna write on the front cover here, um, teaching and then yeah lab notebooks and sometimes when you are doing this this might be the second or third in a series of notebooks and you might want to make note of that um, instead, I'm actually going to go ahead and date this because I know that this lab notebook is really going to serve me for just the year of 2020. So I'm just going to put 2020 on there. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that, but I find that that helps me to keep track of this. Um, I'll go ahead and say teaching lab notebooks number one. How about that? and 2020. And then I'm also going to label the spine of the notebook. So this is the spine. You can see here again, it's labeled 1980. Um, we're going to go ahead and write on here, teaching lab notebooks. And it's okay to repurpose a lab notebook. One thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to repurpose a lab notebook that um, has pages ripped out of it because we don't want a lab notebook to appear to be tampered with. So the lab notebooks in fact can be legally binding um, to be used in a court of law if you've discovered something and you need to be able to provide evidence for that discovery. So we don't want them to appear to have been tampered with. So our purpose is here to Today, it's probably fine that we're repurposing a lab notebook. Um, some very high
highfalutin research labs would probably not allow you to purchase a lab notebook. And in fact, they may even have a particular style of lab notebook that you're required to use um, because they want to make certain that it's, you know, company policy follows what the restrictions are there. I'm putting 2020 on here too, just to, to be clear that we're not, we're no longer in 1980, though it was a good year, um, but uh, that we are now writing in 20, 2020. So that being said, um, I want to go ahead and dive into uh, the actual inside of a lab notebook. And there's some very special pages on the inside of a lab notebook. The first page of the interior of your lab notebook is your sign out page. And the goal for the sign out page is to say who purchased the lab notebook on the date on which you purchased it. Or in this case, I'm making note of how I repurposed this on the 27th of the May of May in 2020. Um, and then per, you want to go on to say a bit about the goal of the notebook. And you can see here, I'm going ahead and writing that. the sign out page in your notebook, you'll reserve this tabular region for the table of contents and the table of abbrevi abbreviations. I was really lucky because this particular repurposed notebook had these pages. So right after I had the sign out page, there was this nice region here. It had originally been for the name of someone, their address and their telephone, but I repurposed it to be the table of contents where you could put the name of the experiment, the date and the page number. So I have that for the table of contents and also the table of abbreviations. Those will fill out as we go and we add more entries. Now, after that, the next page that is of great importance is the preface. So in the preface, you're going to want to say who you are and you're going to want to um, express the um, the supervision that you have in your work. So your supervisors, maybe your coworkers, if you have project partners, which generally you do. This is kind of a unique project because I'm doing this in social social isolation. Even though I do that, though, I feel like I've always got partners out there. Um, stating the goal of the project, the research, summarizing the objectives and aims. Um, and then in some cases, there are other components, depending on what the project is. Like maybe you'll be making reference to other documents that um, someone might be looking for. So in my preface, I wrote, I am Rachel Watson. I direct a signature program within the University of Wyoming Science Initiative. This program called LAMP trains educators across levels and across the state in active learning. 
I also teach microbiology and biochemistry. My microbiology capstone class uses microbiology, chemistry, sociology, a transdisciplinary approach um, to help solve real community problems. Students in Capstone also outreach with K-12 students to bring these younger students into their problem solving and to help them become scientists. So my goal in this notebook is to help student researchers across levels to learn how to maintain a good notebook. My supervisors in the science initiative are Mark Lyford and Greg Brown, um, but I kind of consider all of my students to be important supervisors and that my goal is to inspire you all to do great science. You've now completed the front matter of your lab notebook. The front matter is comprised of your sign out page, your preface, your table of contents, and your table of abbreviation. That means that we're now ready to talk about what goes in the body of your lab notebook. Yes, even a lab notebook has a body. And one of the, the hard things to remember about the body of the lab notebook is all of the things that you should include in the introduction. So the first part of, of each entry that you make for each experiment you do is your introduction. So some of my capstone students decided that they were going to develop a visual way to keep track of all the things that you need in your introduction. So you'll see here that um, we decided on a four quadrant depiction of the things you want to put in your introduction. First off, you always want to start that introduction on a new page, make sure that it's dated, and you always want to title it. Um, so you'll then get, you'll write down uh, one of your boxes will be for the hypothesis. Then you'll have a box for the relevant literature that's informing that particular experiment. You'll have a box for the benefits and a box for safety. Safety first, safety last, safety always. In this experiment, I'm going to be attempting to make a solid growth medium for our home sourdough culture. Um, we're going to do that using a boiled potato, something I've always wanted to try.
section of the body of our notebook is the experimental plan. Your goal for this section is to write down the procedure that you're going to follow with as much detail as is possible. You actually want someone to be able to read your work and to be able to repeat the experiments that you have done. So we want to include things as detailed as the quality of the water that you use, maybe the calibration date of the instruments that you're using, the names of the labware, the composition of the vessels, the reagents that you added, and their lot number. Lots and lots of details that you might include, particularly when you're working with detailed instruments and specific instruments in the lab. What I want you to do with this experiment that we're going to do today is I'm going to write an experimental plan and then we're going to do the experiment and I want you to think about what I could have done even in a more even more detailed way that would have allowed you to repeat that experimental plan because you'll get to both watch me write about it and read it but you'll also get to see me do the actual experiment so you can think about what are some details that maybe I forgot to include when I wrote the experimental plan. Um, and we also know that once rubber hits the road, so to speak, that is, once you actually dive in and do the experiment, your experimental plan may be imperfect. You may realize that, in fact, a different kind of tool may work better than the one that you had planned to use. So you may write that in your observations as you're um, taking detailed notes while you're doing the actual experiment. So I write, I will begin by boiling approximately a gallon of water. I will place a potato in the water um, before turning the heat on. Notice there that I, I made an error. So in a lab notebook, you cross that error out and you initial it. Um, and then I will allow the potato to remain in the water once it reaches a boil for approximately five minutes. Once the five minute mark is reached, I will remove the potato with a slotted spoon. I will uh, allow the potato to cool on the slotted spoon for 10 minutes. The reason we cross with a single line and initial it is so that you can still read what was there. It's not like we're trying to cover anything up, but we're indicating that we made some kind of um, editorial error and that it was ours. That's why we initial it. I will ensure that the potato does not touch any non-sterile surfaces as I do not want it to become contaminated. Once the potato has sat for approximately 10 minutes to cool, um, I will use a sterile knife to cut it in half and then I will cut it in quarters so that the slice will be able to sit stably on a surface. I will place one potato slice on the sterile surface and drip, a, and drip sterile cabbage juice onto the potato slice. This will serve as a color indicator that is sensitive to pH changes. And here I've drawn my experimental setup. You can see the potato, it's been boiled, cutting it into quarters, and then taking a slice that's got a flat surface there that's going to serve as a solid medium, dripping cabbage juice on using some instrument there. I was a little unsure what I would use, and in, you'll see in the experiment what I actually use. Um, and then I've got the colored potato slice. I'm going to use a plant. I had planned to use a butter knife with um, the sourdough culture. I've dipped a sterile butter knife into that sourdough culture, streaked it onto the potato slice. So this was the plan I set out with. Um, and then after streaking the potato slice, I'll place a sterile cover on it and allow it to grow for 24 to 48 hours or until colonies form. Welcome or welcome back to my kitchen. Um, since I've been teaching microbiology, I've been curious about a, an experiment that was done in 1881. There was a man named Robert Koch, and he was the first person to think about the notion of growing microorganisms on a solid surface. And this was really, really important because when bacteria and yeast and other microorganisms are growing together in a liquid culture, they're all mixed up and we can't isolate them. We can't see like individual populations. So in order to see those individual populations, we need a solid surface. So he was seeking some solid surface that would work so that he could streak bacteria and yeast and other microorganisms onto the surface and see different populations grow up on the surface. So what he tried were a variety of things, but one was a potato. And what he did was he boiled a potato and he then sliced the potato into slices and used the sterile surface of the potato to grow organisms on. 
So I've always wanted to try this, so this is our chance to uh, look at what we can grow, and I've decided um, we're gonna use a sourdough culture to see if we can isolate some of the individual, hopefully mostly yeast cultures that are growing in that. Now, one reason that Robert Koch didn't settle on the potato as the right solid growth surface is because it really doesn't support the growth of everything. In fact, yeast are far more likely to like potato for dinner than bacteria are. So you're not gonna get the growth of everything. And eventually he settled on this idea of using an auger extract, an extract of, of rhodophyta, which is a red algae, and that really firms up a nice auger plate, and that, that's history. But at one point he tried with, with the potato. So since we're all stuck at home and we're doing kitchen chemistry and kitchen microbiology, um, I thought it would be fun to try this at home. So what I did was I took a sweet potato that I have, um, I boiled it now for five minutes. Um, so that's enough to get it sterile on all the surface areas and um, it's already sterile on the internal areas. So I'm gonna be able to slice it now. So what I'm gonna do is just get a slatted spoon uh, so I brought it to a boil, um, I put the potato in the water, brought it to a boil, let it boil for five minutes. Then I'm going to pull it out and I'm actually just going to let it cool. So we're going to let it sit for 10 minutes now um, on this slotted spoon, which it's going to stay sterile because we're, we're not going to let it touch anything else. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll cut it into the slices that we need to create the, the um, solid surface for growth. So the potato is boiled and I went ahead and I chopped it into sort of quadrants and I'm taking this second quadrant here because it's got a nice flat surface that can serve as our solid growth medium. So that's where I'm gonna do the streaking, but I'm also gonna get kind of fancy. In microbiology, we use a lot of differential and selective media. What that means, selective media means that it kills certain things while letting others grow. Differential means that it shows the difference between two organisms based upon how they change color or something on a medium. So what I've done is I've boiled an old purple cabbage that I had and I've made this beautiful purple cabbage juice and this is a pH indicator it's a natural pH indicator when it gets really really acidic it turns bright pink when it gets very very basic or alkaline then it turns green so what we're going to do is we're going to put some of this natural cabbage pH indicator onto the potato slice and we're going to try to make a natural differential surface for microbial growth. I don't know if this has actually ever been done before. So I sterilized a spoon, I just did it by boiling, and I'm gonna take a little bit of this purple cabbage juice, and I'm gonna see if I can get it, you can see it's a nice color here in the neutral area, so it's kind of got the same kind of purpley color you would, you would see on a purple cabbage and I'm just going to put it some onto the potato um, surface and I'm going to see if I can get it to absorb into that surface. So woo, I'm a little shaky. There we go. And so we're starting to see it soak in and dye the potato surface. And I'm just going to keep, I'm going to be patient. It's half of science is patience and the other half is safety. You'll notice I'm wearing my safety glasses. Just soaking in. And I used a sterile piece of aluminum foil to go underneath this, so it would be a nice sterile surface. And gradually that's gonna soak in. We'll leave it for just a bit here. All right, so you can see that the red cabbage or purple cabbage juice soaked in. You can tell the difference between the slice that I put it on and the slice that I didn't. Um, so we're gonna give it a try and see if we can isolate some of the microorganisms that are living in the sourdough starter culture. We call this Cleopatra um, because we uh, believe that um, Egypt is the spot that early uh, 
sourdough began, though that's always argumented, people always argue about the origins, everybody wants to claim these good fermented products. So what I am going to do is a technique that we do a lot in the lab. So if you're under 18 and you're wanting to do something like this at home, you need to make sure that your parent or guardian is supervising you because this is, this is the more dangerous thing that we do in this lab or in this kitchen lab. Um, so what we'll be doing is I found, um, I had originally thought I might use a butter knife, but I have a great uh, metal chopstick. And this is actually gonna work a lot like an inoculating loop does when we're working in the lab. And so we're gonna do what we do in the lab, which is called a dip and flame technique. So we just dip this into a little bit of rubbing alcohol um, and we actually set it on fire. Um, it's kind of a, a fun technique because now this is very sterile. So now I can dip this into Cleopatra and I can get all of the mixed up bacteria and yeast that are found in her. Um, and I'm gonna just dip it in there. You can see so much life going on in this. And so I'm gonna see if I can get a little bit of that on here. Um, so we now know that we have a lot of microorganisms on this. Yeast are certainly one of those things. And yeast love a type of auger called potato dextrose auger. So my guess is that the yeast in Cleopatra are gonna like this sweet potato. We're gonna do a technique that's called the triplet streak technique. So this is a technique we use a lot in the lab where we begin in one third area that is gonna be very thick with our streaking. So I'll begin in this area here and I'm gonna streak on Cleopatra very thick in this area. And I'm just gonna see um, up there in that area, we're not gonna get individual populations of microorganisms because we're streaking it on really thick. But then what I'm gonna do, and actually I'm gonna do um, a, a wash and then I'm gonna do a, like a rinse this off so that now we're getting some of that extra gook off of there. So a rinse and then I'm gonna just dry this off. And then now I'm gonna sterilize it again. So um, we'll dip in the, the ethanol and then just light that on fire. Um, and then we're just going to go ahead and pull this down the concentration gradient. What that means is up here, there's a lot of yeast and a lot of bacteria. And we want to make it so we can see individual populations of the yeast and bacteria. So I'm cooling this off so that I don't kill them. So I'm just cooling it on a region of the potato where it's not been inoculated. And then I'm gonna grab up into this highly populated area and I'm just bringing this down the concentration gradient. So now in this area of the potato, this is much lower in um, concentration. There's a lot less bacteria and a lot less yeast. I'm gonna do that one more time. That's why we call it the triplet uh, technique for streaking. So now I'm gonna pull it even more down the concentration and we want to get very isolated colonies, which are individual populations of yeast and, and bacteria, or maybe just yeast right on the potato, liking the potato. So now I went into that second area several times, and now I'm pulling it down in concentration until it's fun, because right here is the least concentrated area, and up here is the most. So it goes most, less, least, kind of in a circle. And that's that triplet streak technique. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna grab a little plastic container that's sterile and I'm gonna put it over the top of that. And I'm gonna leave this at um, room temperature for 24 or 48 hours. And we're gonna see if we start to get growth. Maybe it'll even take longer than that. <music> As 
as you're performing your experiment and immediately after performing your experiment, you want to carefully write down all of the observations. You want to use first person narrative. In fact, all the way through your lab notebook, you always want to use that narrative style. You're telling the story of the experiments that you've done and you're making it very clear who did the work. In retrospect, it's important to know that I was the one that streaked that potato slice um, rather than someone else. So you want to make sure that the details of who did the work are included um, in your, your laboratory notebook. So as you're recording observations, you also may want to record raw data. In, in this particular experiment, we weren't getting a lot of raw data, but sometimes you are. Maybe you're making measurements of pH or temperature or something along those lines. So make sure that you're very detailed in what you write down. It's never too much to write. Um, you can keep in fact, rambling in your notebook. We actually say that technically a notebook is the place for your ramblings. I'm going to read to you the observations that I wrote um, as I was working on this experiment and immediately following. When I put the potato in the water, I was surprised to see that it floated. Hmm. After I boiled and cut the potato and dripped cabbage juice on the quadrant that I would streak, I noticed that the quadrant surface did take on a light purple color. This was compared to the surface that did not have cabbage dripped on it. After leaving the, the slice to dry, kind of on the surface, I realized that it would be easier to streak the surface with a metal chopstick rather than a butter knife. That's what I had originally planned. The dip and flame sterilization worked well for this. When I dipped my chopstick into the sourdough culture, I noticed that there was a harder film on the top that was th of the more viscous liquid. It was easy to inoculate the chopstick as the sourdough liquid is sticky. After streaking first of three regions with the heavy inoculum, I had to rinse the chopstick and then sterilize it again. The top region of the triplet streak was very thick, but it felt to me that dilution in the second and third areas happened very quickly, more quickly than it does on an auger plate. It seemed that the potato slice was more textured, like rough, uh, like sandpaper, compared to an auger plate. And then I draw this uh, image of the triplet streaking on the potato. Um, so notice that some of the things that I write in an observation section are things like, I noticed or it seemed interesting, or it seemed strange, or it seemed unusual. These are all things that you all want to include in an observation. It's just more than 24 hours since we inoculated the sweet potato and we do see some really good growth and you can hopefully zoom in a little bit on this. Um, it's difficult to see and if I do this experiment again, I might add more, um, soak this potentially in the purple cabbage juice. What you are seeing here is the growth um, in the thickest area of our triplet streak. There's a nice kind of layer of purpley white growth. There's kind of more white on this side. There's a little purple on this side. The thing that interests me is as you go to the less concentrated areas, we're actually seeing a few isolated colonies. So over here, particularly kind of nearer the edge, I think because there's more available sugars, because it was more boiled and more cooked along the edge, you can see some individual isolated colonies are tiny little white ones. It looks to me like one single morphology. So one particular yeast most likely liked this potato and has, has formed some little colonies. So we were successful in a sense in that we did isolate a single um, particular culture. In order to characterize it more, we would need a microscope. We would need to be able to do some staining um, and uh, maybe even some biochemical testing to find out exactly what we have there.
Finally, we get to write our discussion and our conclusions. In the discussion, it's a place to think about your data, to think about your observations, to ramble about it and to interpret it. Maybe you need to include some calculations or some charts or some tables. This is an area where we interpret our data. We write to understand our data. So we don't restate our data. So it's not another place to write your results, but instead it's to write your interpretations and, and to narrate your understanding of what's going on, making sense of your data. And of course, then in the conclusions, you're going to state the accomplishments of the experiment. What was found? What Did we achieve our goal? Um, did we test our hypothesis? And if so, did we support it or reject it? Did we have some other things we would want to do differently next time? How would we change it? If we need to do the experiment again, what will we change? We want to write any novel ideas, light bulb moments, what occurred to us. So feel free to write more rather than less in your discussion and your conclusions, because the more you write down, the more your notebook serves as a tool to help you remember and reflect.